Hey there everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about some aviation history again, and assuming you've read the title already and didn't get here by complete accident or horrible misfortune, we're going to be talking about what all the cool kids are talking about. Kamikazes. And no, we're not talking about the drink, but the war strategy affiliated with the Japanese. The origin of the word kamikaze as we know it today comes from an attempted invasion of Japan all the way back in the 1200s when the Mongols attempted to invade Japan. However, their fleet was destroyed by a quote-unquote divine wind, also known as some typhoons. It was a divine wind that saved Japan back then, so when we fast forward to late World War II, we find a Japan in desperate need of some kind of divine intervention again. Since after the Battle of Midway or so, Japan had been pretty consistently on the back foot, losing a good deal of the ground that they had gained in the Pacific. Losing ground and losing battles, it was clear that Japan needed something to try and turn the tides. Critically though, advances in Allied aircraft technology made Japanese planes far less effective than they had been earlier in the war. Additionally, Japan's losses meant that a great deal of their experienced airmen were either dead or out of commission. This left Japan with inexperienced pilots flying inferior aircraft against technologically and numerically superior enemies. To try and counteract this, with the first attack officially occurring on October 9th, 1944, Japan decided to use kamikaze attacks to strike Allied ships, using young, inexperienced, and most importantly, very replaceable pilots. The logic here was that it would be more effective and damaging to have planes just loaded with explosives fly directly into their target. Accuracy would be much greater than a typical dive bomb attack, and any damage taken by the aircraft wouldn't really matter in the long run, since they didn't intend to survive the encounter anyway. Plus, since Japanese Bushido culture meant that dying in battle was considered very honorable, this meant that doing this could be pretty easy to morally justify by that culture standard. Statistically speaking, kamikaze attacks did some damage but weren't terribly effective. While exact numbers aren't known, we can safely say that somewhere between 40 and 100 ships were sunk or irreparably damaged by kamikaze attacks. While this may sound significant, the most common victims were either small transport ships or cargo ships. They did manage to sink three smaller escort carriers, but did not manage to destroy any of the more critically important fleet carriers. They were damaged, to be sure, but not destroyed. It is estimated that about 8.5% of all ships hit by a kamikaze attack sank, but only about 14% of kamikaze pilots actually hit their target in the first place. A vast majority were either destroyed before they could make contact, or they just simply missed. Now if we move over to the European theater of war, we can find the Germans in a rather similar situation at this point in the war. With the Soviet Union making gains on the Eastern Front and Allied forces opening fronts in Europe in Sicily and Normandy in 1943 and 44 respectively, Germany was losing significant ground and needed something to try and turn the tides as well. This led to all kinds of attempted superweapons, new projects, and new fighting units. Now, as you know with the theme of this video, what we're going to be looking at are Germany's attempts at either kamikaze or kamikaze adjacent strategies and aircraft. We'll be going from the least kamikaze to the most kamikaze, imagine that sliding scale there. So we'll be starting with this. This is the BA-349 Natter, a vertical takeoff rocket-powered interceptor. Designed in 1944 in response to the now deteriorating situation the Germans found themselves in, the Natter was an attempt to create a quick launching interceptor that could take out Allied bombers over German territory. It would be launched vertically, guided by a nearly 80 foot tall tower, and four rocket boosters would fire for about 10 full seconds before expending their fuel, giving it that initial propulsion. After this, the pilot, with the assistance of some autopilot technology, would level the craft out and begin approaching the target, using a main rocket motor as its additional propulsion. Once within a range of about 1 to 2 miles, the pilot would activate the main armament, a nose filled with unguided rockets. 
the nose cover would be launched away, and the rockets would be fired all at once. The pilot would then glide down to a lower altitude and activate a parachute to help slow the plane down. The force caused by this parachute deployment would eject the pilot from the plane as well. The pilot and plane would then float back down to Earth, where each could be recovered and, for the plane anyway, scavenged for surviving parts. Now this final product version doesn't sound like a kamikaze plane, but you have to consider one more thing. Early designs of the Natter had a concrete nose, strongly suggesting that it may have been initially intended for it to simply crash into Allied aircraft instead of firing off that rocket barrage. Then there was also the fact that, while the pilot was supposed to be able to survive, the testing showed that they hadn't really worked that part out yet. There was just a single man test flight, and likely due to a canopy malfunction, the pilot was either killed or knocked unconscious on the takeoff, which led to the plane crash landing and definitively killing the pilot if he wasn't already dead. While the Natter was more kamikaze adjacent in its earliest stages, the Mistel program took a more direct approach that, when used, would look exactly like a kamikaze attack. If we take a look at one of the Mistel craft, it basically just looks like two planes stuck together. The concept was that the aircraft on the bottom was stripped of any housing for the crew and any armaments and was simply loaded up with explosives. The pilot would fly from the smaller plane on the top and the lower plane would be dropped at a target as a bomb. The general idea was that it gave smaller fighter aircraft a much larger payload than normal and once the load was dropped, it would be able to have much greater speed and maneuverability than your standard bomber. The project began in 1942 and initially envisioned a Messerschmitt BF-109 fighter with a hollowed-out Junkers Ju-88 serving as the payload. A test flight sometime in mid-1943 proved successful, but the Mistel program would sort of be on the back burner until 1944. Total production of Mistel aircraft would number around 250, mainly using the Ju-88 frame as the bomb and either the BF-109 or FW-190 as the pilot craft. Various other combinations would be produced as well, but in much smaller numbers. Reportedly, though, the Mistel aircraft saw rather little success. According to Allied records, Mistel attacks managed to damage the British frigate Nith killing 9 and wounding 26, but the only other known successes came against the advancing Soviets, where Mistels were used to damage bridges. However, the damage that they caused was rather minimal still, and only slowed the Soviets by a few days at most. Now, while the Mistel program did not actually involve a true kamikaze attack, as the plane frame was unmanned, it did at least give the appearance of being one from the outside. The next project, though, was a bit closer to being an actual kamikaze plane, as the design would have likely led to a lot of pilot deaths. This is the Zeppelin Rammer, and no, it wasn't for ramming Zeppelins, the manufacturer was just called Zeppelin. The Rammer is rather similar to the Natter in its overall design, with its main armament being nose-mounted rockets, and the fact that it would try to glide back down to a safe area. Unlike the Natter, however, the Rammer was supposed to be launched from another aircraft, like how the Mistel bombs were launched. Once launched, they fired a rocket booster for their propulsion. They would first launch their nose rockets, like the Natter, before going in for a direct ramming attack. I should mention here that aerial ramming was not a unique concept and had been done by other nations at other times, the Soviets early in the war come to mind, However, it was generally still a spur-of-the-moment thing done in very specific situations. But regardless, the survivability of the rammer would hypothetically be a bit higher than normal, as the rammer was supposed to have steel supports on the front of the wings. The pilot would try and use their wings to destroy the wings or tails of enemy bombers before gliding back down to Earth, and, hopefully, surviving the landing on their retractable skids. However, after a small order of about 16 of these planes was placed, the Zeppelin factory was destroyed in a bombing run, and the project was ended, meaning that these never actually were made or took to the skies. 
I should also mention here another rammer concept that didn't even get so far as to get an order placed, but did prove highly influential in aircraft design. The Lippish P-13A used a unique triangular shape, what we now know as a delta wing type layout. Testing on this was still ongoing by the time the war ended and its creator, Alexander Lippish, was brought in to assist American aviation research, where his ideas contributed to several aircraft the U.S. would use, like the F-102, the F-106, and the B-58. But anyway, I think it's pretty obvious why planes like these were kamikaze-esque. I mean, they were supposed to ram these planes directly into other planes and just hopefully not die in the process. Sure, it wasn't intended for the pilots to die, but they likely wouldn't have had a very good survival rate. For an example of Germany actually using ramming craft, we can look at Sonderkommando Elbe. This group formed later in the war in a desperate attempt to reduce the number of Allied bombers in German skies, a very common theme here, was to simply use BF-109 fighters, stripped of most of its armor and armaments, and rammed directly into enemy bombers. Specifically, they were to target either the tail, the wing-mounted engines, or the cockpit. To increase the survival rate, the pilots were supposed to just eject before crashing into the enemy bomber and parachute back out to safety. Keep in mind, these planes did not have ejector seats, so they had to manually climb out. So at this stage of war, much like Japan, Germany was desperate for some way to stop the advancing Allied forces. Additionally, all the previous fighting left many of their experienced pilots dead or out of commission. So Germany would use inexperienced pilots to fly these quasi-suicide missions for Sonderkommando Elbe. After all, their task was basically just to fly directly into a target. They didn't really need extensive training for this. Still, though, their single sortie flown on April 7, 1945 wasn't all that successful, as somewhere between 8 and 13 bombers were destroyed, costing Germany an estimated 53 planes and several more dead pilots. It wasn't totally ineffective, and again, the tactic of aircraft ramming was nothing new, but the obvious danger of using these fighters specifically for ramming made it the second closest thing Germany had to kamikazes. The closest thing, on the other hand, wasn't just conceptually close to being a kamikaze, it was overtly a kamikaze unit. It was the Leonidas Squadron. The Leonidas Squadron, formed under the Luftwaffe Special Operations Unit KG-200, was intended to be an outright kamikaze unit, using inexperienced volunteer recruits to fly rocket planes or bomb-filled fighters to their deaths. The name serves as an obvious reference to Spartan King Leonidas and the Battle of Thermopylae, paying homage to the self-sacrifice of Leonidas and the Spartans there. The squadron consisted of a group of about 70 volunteers. These volunteers were required to sign a document that read, in part, I hereby voluntarily apply to be enrolled in the group as part of a human glider bomb. I fully understand that employment in this capacity will entail my own death. While the program was met with relatively little interest by the likes of Hermann Göring and Adolf Hitler, the latter of which believed it was not in the German spirit to fight like this, the project was still allowed to continue on regardless. The initial plan was to use the then prototype ME-328 pulse jet aircraft. The plane would be loaded up with explosives, would dive bomb underneath Allied ships, and explode. After the ME-328 project was cancelled, however, the plan shifted to using the manned versions of the V-1 rockets known as FI-103R Reichenberg. However, these aircrafts similarly came to nothing. Then, in June 1944, just three days after the landings at Normandy, several FW-190s were loaded up with massive payloads and were ready to use in a kamikaze role for this unit. However, this never came to fruition, as the head of KG-200, Werner Baumbach, decided against this idea and instead wanted to focus on the Mistel idea, as it was much safer to the pilot and reduced the amount of unnecessary death. Eventually, in the very last days of the European theater of the war, from April 17th to the 20th, 
a number of the volunteer Leonidas pilots would finally take to the skies and kamikaze bomb into several bridges in an attempt to slow the Soviet advance, definitively destroying one and damaging several others. Of course, this failed to do much to halt the Soviet advance, thus the 35 volunteers took their lives for no tangible gain. So, to conclude, we can draw a major comparison here between the Japanese kamikazes and the German kamikazes and quasi-kamikazes. They were done in desperation when they were on the back foot and needed something to try and counter the enemy advance. They lacked trained pilots after years of grueling warfare and thus resorted to throwing undertrained men into a metaphorical meat grinder, exploiting their fanaticism and dedication to their country. Essentially, these groups and planes were a sign that the tide of war was fully against them, which led to their desperate moves. And their desperate moves just led to more unnecessary death and destruction. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and stop there. Uh, thank you all for watching the video. If you haven't already, remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and ring the bell. You know, click all the stuff. Maybe check out some of my other videos as well, and click around on those too. It'll be fun. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and at the very least, I hope you learned something. Alright, see ya.